gentlemen, and welcome to Sports Science. My name is Connor Flaherty, and I will be co-hosting tonight with Larson Tolo, Xander Kiao, Garrett Kurtz, Tommy Swank, Kyle Edelman, Jack Boyden, and Kyle Amitay. Boarding live from Tufts University, I'm here at Pearson Laboratory. At Pearson Laboratory, the course Big Bang to Humankind was taught. This evening, our sports science team is reviewing some of the best moments from this course. There were five main topics taught this semester, which were astronomy, geology, chemistry, biology, and anthropology. Given these five main topics, our team will be taking each of them and finding a highlight, recognizing some of the most interesting information that was taught. Without further ado, take it away, Garrett. Thank you, Flaherty, and good evening, world. My name is Garrett Kurtz, running from Virginia, and I'm honored to kickstart this highlight tape with one of arguably the most important tools in astronomy, light. The galaxy is one monstrous beast, let alone the universe. For instance, the nearest stars are whopping 4.2 light years away. The closest galaxy is 2.5 million light years away. But with the help of light, we can study far into the universe. Let's get started. Everything that has a temperature also gives off light. They are inseparable. Through the light and color, we can then determine temperature and motion. For instance, red means it's cooler and blue means it's hot. I know, not what it seems. In addition to temperature, light and color can also tell us the motion of an object. When it is moving towards us, that object appears to be blue shifted. And when it is moving away from us, it appears to be red shifted. The speed of the object then can be calculated from this shift. And the faster it is moving, the more pronounced the shift will be. Scientists, such as myself and my group, can also figure out the composition of planets from the light by taking a spectrum of light. All elements absorb and emit different variations of light. And if the light we observe from a celestial body has a darker region where the light has been absorbed by a specific element, we know the element is present in that object. Crazy. Whoa, I'm in a solar spectrum. Perfect. It's one in the sun. As you can tell, there's gaps in it. In those gaps, you can see what elements are present because those elements absorb the light. Now, another diagram that cannot be left on this highlight tape is the Hertzberg-Russell diagram, in which the absolute magnitudes of stars are plotted against their spectral types. Now, most stars in this diagram are in the region known as the main sequence. Wow, in the upper left is the hot and bright ones, and the bottom right are the cool and dim ones. Now, before I hand off the mic to my partner, Tolo, you have to understand one thing and forget everything else in this evening. Our universe is unimaginably big. Studying it is honestly impossible, for we can't go to the outreaches part of the universe. But through light, we can bring the universe into our labs and study it up close and in person. It's crazy. Now, I'm going to hand the partner off to my partner, Tolo, best dancer at Tufts, reporting from Boston. Here you go. Thank you, Mr. Kurtz. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Larson Tolo here, reporting from our Boston offices to take a step back in time and look at the origins of our league. Now, we all know how essential water is to our lives, but how exactly did it get here on Earth? Ice can only exist past the frost line, which is three astronomical units away from our sun, yet we are one astronomical unit away from the sun, and somehow we still have water. Thus, what our most reputable scientists theorize is that water was in fact delivered to our world as ice debris from past the frost line via asteroids in the Earth's early formation. These asteroid-like objects broke through our atmosphere and impacted with the Earth, thus scattering the ice around to later melt into water through our planet's close proximity to the sun. The strength of Earth's gravity has then been able to retain that water, providing us with the resources we need to survive. However, in addition to this fact, material from outer space is constantly hitting the Earth at a clip of about 30,000 tons a year. This material contains water, organic material, and amino acids, providing us with more than enough resources for our planet to thrive. Thus, as you can see from the photo behind me, Our planet as we know it is directly tied to and owes a great thanks to the Big Bang and materials from other worlds. Now let's hand it off to Tommy Swank down in Connecticut to tell us a little bit more about the rocks beneath our feet. Take it away, Tommy. Thanks, Larson. I'm Tommy Swank in our Connecticut office, and uh, today I just want to go over the magnificent thing that the Earth is, such a massive object, yet habitable by almost 8 billion human beings. But the crazy thing is, Carbon is our uh, foundation of all life forms, but 99.8% uh, of that is still locked up in rocks deep inside the earth. Um, but as we all know, the earth is not all carbon. Um, there are countless amount of materials and other minerals that make up the earth's crust, mantle, and the core with the lithosphere, uh, athenosphere, 
and the lower mantle making up the mantle, outer core and inner core, or outer core being liquid and inner core being rigid. There's so many materials and minerals locked up deep inside those different uh, layers of the earth that um, are really just uh, the foundation of everything that the earth is built around. Um, but let's not forget to talk about uh, James Hutton, who found vertical strata under horizontal strata. Uh, this meaning that we could find proof that the polarity in the earth was flipped. And we uh, can now do this by using graphs called paleomagnetism, which shows us how the blocks that are shown here are shown as um, normal polarity, whereas the gaps are where uh, the polarity was flipped inside the Earth. Um, and Earth's polarity would not be possible without the great efforts of the magma that flows through the Earth nonstop, convecting and creating a magnetic field which surrounds the Earth. Now we go over to JB and see what he has to say. Thanks, Swanker, for the amazing insight. Hi, I'm International Correspondent Jack Boyd, and here to talk to you about atmospheres. Earth's atmosphere is composed of about 78% nitrogen and about 21% oxygen. The remaining 1% is composed of argon, carbon dioxide, and neon. Plants' atmospheres can form in two major ways, sublimation and outgassing. Sublimation is conversion from a solid state to a gaseous state, whereas outgassing is a process that usually arises from volcanic activity, which releases gases causing a secondary atmosphere as you can see with this diagram right here. Different planets retain different gases depending on their mass. Gases have different escape speeds, and the more mass and gravity a planet has, the more gases they will retain. Next up is the greenhouse gas effect, which heats our planet. As solar radiation hits the Earth, the atmosphere and greenhouse gases, predominantly CO2 and H2O, retain some of the sunlight trying to escape back to the vast chilly space to keep us warm. You can see with this diagram right here. But watch out, too much production of man-made greenhouse gases can heat up the earth too much over long periods of time, potentially having a disastrous effect. You can do your part by staying green. Maybe invest in a sweet, quiet electric car. As entrepreneur Little Wayne once said, real G's move in silence like lasagna. Over to our Boston correspondent, Xander Keough. Thanks, JB. I'm Xander Keough, reporting live from our Boston studios, here to describe the incredible life and journey of carbon. Carbon is a key component to our life. It comes in two forms, carbon dioxide and methane, and can be found in our soils, rocks and sediments, oceans, and even our atmosphere. Here's a diagram of the carbon cycle. Carbon in the atmosphere gets absorbed by plants through photosynthesis. From there, through decaying organisms, it's released into the ground. Or, when the plant is eaten by animals, it's released in the ground through the animal's waste products. Some of this carbon is automatically released back into the atmosphere through a decaying process with the soil. But some of the carbon stuck in our fossil fuels sits underground until Humans burn these fossil fuels, which releases the carbon back into the atmosphere. Carbon will go through this cycle many times throughout its life. Now, here with me is our special guest, Carbon. Thanks for being on the show, Carbon. What do you have to say about your incredible journey? Wow, truly inspirational. Back to you in the studio. Thanks, Zon. I appreciate your in-depth review of the carbon cycle. Now I will be examining photosynthesis, who is a key contributor in the carbon cycle. There are two primary steps to the process, which are known as light-dependent and light-independent reactions, which both take place in the chloroplast. In the first step, the light-independent reactions, light is captured by the chlorophyll, which is stored in the thylakoid membranes of the chloroplast. In these reactions, energy from sunlight is absorbed by the chlorophyll and converted into stored chemical energy in the form of electron character molecule NADPH and the energy currency molecule ATP. A multi-protein complex called a photosystem converts the light energy into chemical energy. There are two types of photosystems that are embedded in the thylakoid membrane. There's photosystem 1 and photosystem 2. 
Each photosystem plays a key role in capturing the energy from sunlight by exciting the individual electrons. Here in this graphic, you can see electron transport chain 1 and electron transport chain 2. Here's photosystem 1 and photosystem 2. Here, you can clearly see how the chlorophyll take the H2O and break it down, separating the electron. From there, the energized electrons are transported by the energy carrier molecules, NADPH and ATP, which power the light-independent reactions. In the light-independent reactions, or the energized, where the energized electrons are transferred to, the reactions provide the energy to perform carbohydrates from carbon dioxide molecules. Light-independent reactions are sometimes called the Calvin cycle because of the silical nature of the process. Although light-independent reactions do not use light as a reactant, and as a result can take place day or night, they require the products of light-dependent reactions to function. The light-independent molecules depend on the energy carrying molecules ATP and NADPH to drive the construction of new carbohydrate molecules. After energy is transferred, the energy carrying molecules return to the light-dependent reaction to obtain more energized electrons. However, before we move forward, I'd like to give a specific description of what happens in the light-independent reactions. A 5-carbon molecule picks up the CO2, creating a 6-carbon compound. From there, Rubisco, utilizing energy from ATP and NADPH, breaks the 6-carbon molecule into 3-carbon molecules. One of the 3-carbon leaves to become sugar and starch for the cell and the plant. The other 3-carbon molecules goes on with the cycle, and are returned to the light-dependent reactions through the ATP and NADPH. From there, the cycle repeats. Now, passing along to Kyle to talk about biology. Thank you, Connor. I'm Kyle Edelman, your reporter on biology, talking to you about an exciting new prospect, the cell. Now, these cells are all over the place recently. It's basically a biological unit of all living organisms. There's a lot to like about it. Very efficient at storing our genetic information. Our DNA is wrapped very tightly around a protein called a histone, which are effectively packed to make up chromatin. These building blocks of our chromosomes are found in every cell's nucleus. Unraveled, DNA in a single cell would stretch out over six feet. Another thing I like about the cell is its ability to replicate itself. It recombines chromatids in this process, allowing for genetic variability. Also, love the cell's versatility. The stem cell, which can differentiate into ver different types of cells or replicate itself. However, one drawback of the cell division is that there are occasional errors in copying the DNA, which can lead to positive effects, no effects, or complete loss of function. These mutations are the foundation of natural selection, but these errors can be fixed by modern technology through methods such as CRISPR, gene editing, and the rise of GMOs. These cells are truly at the forefront of modern technology. Now to Kyle Almonte for Anthropology. Nigel Williams here. In the course of human history, we've had plenty of different species come and go, subsequently pushing forth the evolutionary track until the Homo sapiens came to dominate about 100,000 years ago. Today we're going to honour some of the unsung heroes, because if it weren't for them, well, frankly, we'd just be a bunch of orangutans. Our first unsung heroes are the Neanderthals. Often the butt of pretentious Homo sapiens jokes, Neanderthals were adept in tool making and dominant hunters. Known for their short, robust and hairy body frames, they had quite a bit of culture as well. They painted caves, carved seashells and even wore feather hats. Neanderthals made their own music, which is the first recorded of that time. Not bad for just a bunch of Neanderthals, am I right? Yeehaw! All right, we're going to travel around 100,000 years into the future to the Americas, Newfound, of course, to recognize the pre-Clovis people. Now, if you thought that there was no one in the Americas before the Clovis people around 10,000 years ago, you're wrong, okay? These pre-Clovis people, they came here. They left artifacts. We've seen it at Topper Site. We've seen it at Cactus Hill. We know that they're there. They hunted. They ate. They ate good, too, and they made families in America before the Clovis people ever existed. They probably came over the land bridge in Bering Strait, or maybe even down the coastal route. That's it for tonight's show. Thank you for tuning in, and return next week for another edition of Sports Science.